Welcome to Downtown Sports. My name is Downtown Stephen Brown, and in today's video, guys, I want to go over the last couple of Toronto Maple Leaf games, talk about some news and some notes, and just talk about some stuff. So I want to start with tonight's lineup against the Calgary Flames tonight. The Maple Leafs opting to go with 11 forwards and 7 defensemen. And that was because Wayne Simmons wasn't going to be available to them tonight because he's still back at home with his wife as they just had a baby. But also with Jake Muzzin just coming back from a concussion and Travis Dermott also feeling under the weather, it just allows the team to spread out the minutes a little bit more and not have to push guys when they're not at 100%. That's a factor in it, but it also has to do with the salary cap. Ever since the Toronto Maple Leafs placed Nick Ritchie on waivers a little while ago, they've been under the salary cap limit, which means that they've been slowly accumulating and banking some cap space. Because of the amount of COVID cases league-wide over the last couple of months, the NHL instituted relaxed for emergency recall rules. But since the taxi squad and those emergency recall rules are no longer around, uh, we've resorted back to the old rules, where if you only got 11 forwards, you got to play with 11 forwards for that one game, and then if you're still going to be short the next, you can make an emergency recall for $0 against your salary cap on a player who's making $800,000 or less. All of that context to just say that if the Maple Leafs have an injury up front, we can expect to see them play with 11 forwards and 7 defensemen a little more often between now and the trade deadline. You could send a guy like Timothy Lilligren down and you can afford to call up that extra forward and just play with 12 forwards and 6 defensemen, but the problem with that is that Kyle Davis has said that the team wants to see guys like Rasmus Sandin and Timothy Lilligren play as much as possible between now and the trade deadline so that they know what they have come playoff time. But getting to the actual game here, I don't think that this box score of advanced analytics really means much tonight. Because while the Toronto Maple Leafs did control the majority of the shot attempts at 5-on-5 five five in every single period of play, and overall by a decent margin, and while they led the shots in every single period of play by a decent margin, and while they led the scoring opportunities overall by a decent margin, if you're looking at the expected goals, there's not that big of a difference. This, in fact, was a game where the Maple Leafs directed a lot of shots on goal and had a decent amount of scoring opportunities, but the quality just wasn't there. And when they were there, Jacob Markstrom was very much up to the task. The narrative coming out of this game was that the Toronto Maple Leafs got physically outmatched and bullied, and it's another reason why they're not going to win in the playoffs this year. While I will agree that, yeah, the Maple Leafs got physically outplayed in this game, and yeah, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more pushback from them, the game still was 2-1 to one more than halfway through the second period, and at that point, the shots were like 30-15 to 15 for the Maple Leafs. Um, the Flames just didn't have the puck very much, so I would hope that they were playing a little bit physical, because otherwise, what would they have been doing? The 2-1 goal, maybe you would have liked to have seen Justin Hall close that gap a little bit more and not give Andrew Mangiapane the space and the time to get off a shot, even from his back foot and falling over. I mean, the shot did still beat Jack Campbell, right? It wasn't his greatest of game. Maybe you would have liked him to have had a save there. Uh, the 3-1 goal, the slap shot from the point, it hit Jake Muzzin, but it beat Jack Campbell. Maybe you would have liked him to have had a save there. I mean, it's hockey, right? There's a lot of bounces you need some saves off them. That's not to say that any one party was more at fault than the other, but when you start adding this up, they were playing with 10 forwards after Anse Kasha left the game. Muzzin was just coming back from a concussion. Dermot was feeling under the weather. They were kind of getting pushed around. Campbell wasn't necessarily playing his greatest. It's a Thursday night in February, and to be honest, with the way that the last game ended with the scary play involving Austin Matthews, I was just happy that the guy looked like he was absolutely flying around and still himself. The team is 26-7-2 since the beginning of November, which ranks second in the NHL in points percentage. They're also 10-3-1 in 2022 so far. It's like, I don't know, they've been on three five-game win streaks and one six-game win streak. So four win streaks of at least five games this year. They lose like one game every two or three weeks. And I guess when they lose, it <laughs> they really lose. And even when they win, uh, oh boy, <laughs> there's some doubt at times. But they have won a lot of games the last couple of months. And we're like three days removed from them arguably playing their best game of the season. I mean, that was the most fun that I've had watching a Leafs game basically all year long. And they lost the shot attempt battle. They got outshot in the game. It was looking pretty miserable through the first two periods. But overall, the scoring opportunity is at five on five. They held their own there, and 
The most important part is that they came to play in that third period, winning the shot attempt battle 14 to 13, winning the actual shots 8 to 6, coming away with the scoring opportunity 7 to 5, and leading the expected goal battle in that third period. They battled back against one of the best teams in the NHL, and if you're looking at the game overall, their special teams really came to play in that game. A couple of big kills, the power play was absolutely rolling against one of the uh, best penalty kills in the league, mind you. Right? Frederick Anderson, a Vesna candidate out there, sure made him look bad in that third period and in that overtime. It's just, that Carolina game was so good on so many levels, and people were so happy, and now it seems like there's a lot of very, very angry people in Leafs Nation. But I guess that's the way that it is, being a sports fan and cheering for a team that hasn't won a playoff series in however many, many years and lost in the first round and uh, however many years it's been now. Who would have known? Losing is not very fun and sometimes it's infuriating. <laughs> There's just so much pressure on them to perform and everyone wants to see them win. And because of that, naturally, everyone is going to look at the team and say, okay, how can we make this already good team even that much better, right? How can we foolproof it so that they can't screw it up this time? And I mean, you're watching the games, you're watching these videos, you're saying to yourself, you know, man, they could really use another top four defenseman. And I've been saying, man, they could really use another top four defenseman. But maybe earlier on in the season, you're saying to yourself, well, maybe they can get that if a guy like Timothy Lilligren or Rasmus Sandin takes steps in their development, right? They're young and up-and-coming players. Maybe you say to yourself, if they can just get Jake Muzzin to be Jake Muzzin, they'd be in pretty decent shape because he's been one of the better two-way defensemen in the NHL the last couple of seasons. But the longer that it goes on where they don't get that to the extent that they need it, it's a little bit frustrating. So maybe you say to yourself, okay, well, can they make a trade? But they don't really have very much cap space to work with. And even if they can find the cap space, the trade market this year, not the greatest. Apparently, anyone who's anyone and average is worth a first round pick. You know, I get it. It's kind of frustrating. It's been really cold and snowy the last little while. And even when it's not very cold, it's just kind of slushy and icy outside. And it's 1030 on a Thursday and you stayed up late to watch this game. Maybe you got school or work tomorrow. And it's just they're getting out hit and they're directing a lot of shots towards the net. And even when they are doing that, not a lot's happening. And Anze Kasha goes down and then Darcy Tucker tweets out that he'd really love to be in Calgary tonight with a pair of skates. And it's like, damn right, Darcy. I'd like for you to be in Calgary tonight with a pair of skates too. They're already down two forwards. Get out there and do something. You know, there's a lot of amazing Darcy Tucker moments from his career in Toronto. There was the one season towards the end where he scored like 15 goals from like the goal line where he would go down to like one knee and just slap it in or the time that he fought the entire Ottawa bench or the time when he came out from the dressing room while he was riding the exercise bike in full workout gear to just fight Cam Jansen after he need Thomas Caberlet. And you're looking for that type of energy on a Thursday night at 1030 and it's just not there. You know, maybe the Leafs are feeling a little bit sentimental. It's Valentine's Day coming up and... They just, uh, their head, they just weren't in it tonight. But man, we cannot go from best win of the season three days ago to the sky is falling. Nobody has that type of range. Jack Campbell played like a Vesna candidate the first half of this season. And yeah, he hasn't been the greatest in 2022 so far, but that's why they got that guy Peter Mrazek, right? To be a 1B in the tandem with Jack. And so far in 2022, hey, he's healthy. He's playing games on a more consistent basis. And who knew? He's the goalie that we thought he would be. They got two goalies. They got two goalies. They haven't had that in forever. Since maybe like Reimer and Bernier. Oh my God. I don't know. They got five guys who are on pace for over a point per game this year. Austin Matthews could win the Rocket Richard Trophy this year after being 10 goals back from the start of December. Michael Bunting's on pace for like 20, 25 goals this year. Anze Kosh has been an amazing story. Rasmus Sandin is a hell of a lot of fun to watch in his own zone tonight. He was falling behind the net, but still found a way to poke the puck to one of his teammates, and it led to a breakout with possession. There are so many things to love about this team. The power play is like the best in the league. The penalty kill is like a top three as well. There's so many things to love about this team, and I can tell you the people that are frustrated with it just want to see it be that much better. But the one thing that we can just say it with me here, they will get a top four defenseman. They will get a top four defenseman. They will. And when they do, man, this team's going to be a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun right now, but it'll be even funner, if that's a word, 
when they do. I'm not saying that the Maple Leafs can't or shouldn't be more physical out there, but this is back-to-back -back games where Anze Kasha has gotten hit pretty hard, but in the game against Carolina, Wayne Simmons stepped in and had a fight. In the game tonight against Calgary, Morgan Riley stepped in and defended his teammate. There were multiple scrums in front of the net as well. Um, and the physicalness is not the reason why they lost the last couple of playoff series. It's just that they couldn't score. They were getting pushed around in the offensive zone and blocked out. And I think that they've done a much better job against good defensive teams this year, scoring goals from in tight when you do have less time and less space. And that's Michael Bunting and Anze Kasha and William Nylander doing it, but also Mitch Marner. And that's going to be huge for the team this playoffs. But also, if the Maple Leafs do want to be more physical out there, because I think that they should, at least a little bit, right? If they're getting pushed around, they should at least push back. Um, it can't just be by adding a guy and expecting them to carry the load. This needs to be a team mentality. And like we said, big hits on Anze Kasha, back-to-back -back games, and teammates have stepped in. There were a lot of scrums in front of the net tonight against Calgary. Maybe they didn't push back as much as you would have liked them to, but there still are games between now and the trade deadline and now and the end of the regular season. Let's see if this group is able to get that top four defenseman, improve defensively, stick up for themselves a little bit more, but also continue to build on being a lot stronger offensively in front of the other team's net. That's going to be it for this video, guys. Make sure to like it if you did like it and subscribe more because more is always on the way. And if you haven't noticed, we've been doing some videos the last little while looking at specific defensemen that the Maple Leafs are either interested in or that are going to be available at this year's trade deadline. If I haven't talked about the defensemen that you maybe want to see them acquire, um, I will. You know, I'm not just going to talk about them all in one video because then I'm not going to have anything else to talk about between now and the trade deadline. So we're doing... Um, a video on each of the guys, at least the more well-known names and the lesser known guys. Maybe we'll do two or three of them in one video or so. Um, should expect another video either Saturday or Sunday where we're going to be looking at two defensemen in particular. One of them, a former Toronto Maple Leaf and another one who's very, very tall. That's all I'm going to give you. So look out for that video either Saturday or Sunday and take care. I'll see you in the next one, guys.